Nipoli to Nano Agreement started the cycle of webinars in May 2020. It is already three years of continuous interlearning. In the Andean Health Organization Convenio Nipoli to Nano Agreement, we promote health and well being as well as social and environmental justice. We firmly believe that a one health approach is essential to achieve the highest possible level of health in our populations. And that it is undoubtedly an important approach to the issue that brings us together today, such as dengue fever. Reflections on these and other relevant priorities for health and well being can be found in the Noti Salud Andinas newsletter, monthly edition available on the website of the Andean Health Organization. We invite you to leave your name, organization, and country in the comment box of the Facebook Live or YouTube Live chat. In the same space, you can leave your questions or send them via email to webinar orasconhu at gmail.com. In this webinar, we will follow the usual dynamics. We will start with the institutional greeting, followed by the lectures of our speakers, and then we will move to the Q&A session. To ac access the certificate of attendance, as usual, in any of the chats of Facebook, Facebook Live or YouTube Live, you will find a fixed link where you must fill out a brief survey and leave your data as email. And please verify that your email is correctly written for sending the certificate, which will be sent in the coming days to your emails. Beginning this important day, I give the floor to Dr. Maria Carmen Calle, Executive Secretary of the Andean Health Organization, who will give you the welcome and institutional greeting. Go ahead, Dr. Maria Carmen. Thank you, Lucho. Well, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to webinar number 178, entitled Dengue Diagnosis, Clinic and Treatment. We greet you from San Pedro Island in Belize. We participated in the mini health ministers meeting of Central America and Dominican Republic. We want to give the welcome words because in the context in which our region finds itself, the Andean Health Agency Poly to Nano Agreement consider it pertinent to address this public health problem once again. So far this year, the region of the Americas has accumulated more than 2 million cases, approximately 2,860 cases of severe dengue fever, of which 827 deaths have been reported. In the case of the Andean subregion, 333,056 cases have accumulated. That is 16% of the total cases in the region of the Americas. However, the Andean subregion has accumulated 1,682 severe cases and 363 deaths, which represents 58.81% of the total number of severe cases and 43.89% of the total number of fatal cases in the entire region of the Americas, which demonstrates the vulnerability of our region to dengue. In this context, it is of utmost importance to promote measures to prevent dengue cases through vector control, early detection of cases, adequate patient management, and preparation of services for outbreaks as well 
as training health human resources in diagnosis, identification of clinical signs, and treatment of severe cases. Horas Konhu is committed to address this and other arboviroses. Why? Together with strategic allies, such as the Pan American Health Organization, we have carried out activities such as the formation of a network of clinical experts in the management of dengue and other arboviroses, for which training workshops on clinical diagnosis and management of dengue in Chinkunguya have been held in the month of October 2022 and March 2023. These workshops highlighted the importance of the management of patients with dengue, the identification of warning signs, the management of dengue cases according to levels of care, the approach to cases in adults and children, among other topics. This webinar aims to provide information on timely diagnosis and clinical picture of dengue cases, in addition to present the proper management of severe dengue cases in adults and children. To meet this objective, we have invited specialists from the Pan American Health Organization and the Pedro Curi Institute of Tropical Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Jose Guadalupe Martinez from the Pan American Health Organization. Welcome, Dr. Osvaldo Enrique Castro Peraza and Dr. Eric Martinez Torres from the Pedro Curi Institute of Tropical Medicine of Cuba. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Mariel Carmen Calle, Executive Secretary of the Andean Health Organization. After this greeting of our executive secretary, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Patricia Gallardo, international consultant representing the sub-regional program of South America, AHO SAM. Go ahead, Dr. Gallardo. Good morning to everyone. I think that Dr. Marika Mancalle has put in context the effort being done in this region, in the sub-regional program, from all the points of our organization. We are committed with this topic. We saw this on a daily basis the, in the effort by the country with the ministries, as well as the level of the mechanism of our integration, such as the ORAS Conju. This is a very important space to generate this exchange of experiences got the experts with us from different areas, such as Dr. Martinez, Dr. Castro, and Dr. Torres. So we are here at your disposal for a joint effort. And from the South Regional Program for South America, we will continue working and strengthening agendas that are present on a daily basis, especially in this emergency. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Dr. Gallardo, for your institutional greetings. After the incident, I will have to introduce myself. I'm Luis Bingolea, I'm an epidemiologist, coordinator of the working group on arbovirosis and dengue in the Andean Health Organization. And today I will be in charge of moderating this webinar. Climate change is affecting health in many ways, causing death and illnesses from increasingly frequent extreme weather events, such as heat waves, storms, and floods. Coastal Nino and the Yaku Cyclone are one of the recent examples, whose consequences are disruption of food systems, increases in zoonosis, and foodborne and waterborne and vector-borne diseases and mental health problems. These climate-sensitive health risks disproportionately affect the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people, 
such as women, children, ethnic minorities, poor communities, migrants, or displaced persons, elderly populations, and people with underlying health problems. All of this puts great pressure on health systems, making it necessary to strengthen multi-sectoral response programs so that together we can reduce the risks and avoid major emergency. In this meeting, we will ad address one of the critical issues generated by dengue complications. And we have invited international experts, Dr. Jose Guadalupe Martinez Nunez. He is a surgeon and midwife from the University Autónoma New Nuevo León. He did his residency at the Dr. Jose Leuterio Gonzalez Hospital. He's a pediatrician by the University of Autónoma San Luis Potosí, an infectious pediatrician by the National Institute of Pediatrics. He has been a dengue clinical advisor, international dengue GTI WHO PAHO between 2000 to 2023. He's a dengue clinical advisor for more than 20 years. He has been a teacher at the University Autónoma of Nuevo León from 1988 to 2021. Is a member of the Mexican Association of Pediatric Infectology, the Latin American Society of Pediatric Infectology, the College of Pediatrics of Nuevo León, CONAPEME, College of Infectology of Nuevo León. And he's also an author and co-author of publications in books and journals. Go ahead, dear Dr. Jose Guadalupe Martinez, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruiz. Good morning. Good afternoon in Cuba. I think it's the afternoon. First, I would like to thank to the Andean Health Organization for the invitation to be with you and to PAHO. And I would like to share with Dr. Osvaldo Castro and Dr. Eric Martinez that which are persons who have a great experience in the topic. You see the slides? Not yet? Okay. All right. Ya ingresó la presentación. Sí. Falta ponerlo yeah. en modo. Sí, 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 sí. Ahorita en, yes. en este momento. Presentation mode. Perfecto. Ok. Gracias. We will, we will eh, start. Que todo... First of all, I don't have any disclosures for this presentation. Eh, vamos a de revisar... uh, we're going to review the pathophysiological mechanisms and what happens in patients with dengue. I will start with the definition which I made in Cuba in a meeting in IPCA precisely. That is very important. Dengue is a single systemic and dynamic disease. It, all organs, it's dynamic because it changes. It has a process with several forms of clinical expression and unpredictable evolution. For that reason, it is very important to follow the patient during the disease process in order to provide adequate interventions and decrease the risks of death. Dengue is a viral disease transmitted by mos mosquitoes Aedes genus. It's produced by an RNA virus called dengue virus. Arbovirus, which we have in identified four serotypes, and is usually defined as an acute febrile illness. And something important is that according to the immunologic experience of populations and viral circulation, in general, between 80 and 90% 90 of those infected are asymptomatic. But these are people that can transmit the disease. We define a suspected case of dengue 
a, a person who lives or has traveled in the last 14 days to areas with dengue transmission and presents acute fever, usually of two, uh, two or more of the following manifestations. And we're going to talk about them later. That's very important. If it shows any sign of alarm or any sign of severity, we will have to think in dengue infection. So we mentioned that dengue is a disease transmitted by bites of female Aedes mosquitoes, the Aegypti or Albopectus, which are the predominant one, but there also been recordings of transmission by puncture of people who, who handled blood of people with dengue through a transfusion of asymptomatic persons who donate blood, they may transmit the disease or something that we need to take into consideration. It can be transmitted from mother to child. And children have a risk of developing neonatal dengue, not transmitted by mother's breast, and there's no sexual transmission like in the Zika case. So that's something important. This graph was shared by Dr. Eric Martinez, and I'm going to quickly show you the female bites. The infected female bites and lays the eggs, and these are affected by the macrophages and affected to the mononuclear phagocytic and going to activate cells at the central level and it may have several effects. One is to activate T cells, B cells, and produce a intense response that can generate the release of some substances, like you see, gamma interferon, tumor necrosis factor that are going to affect different organs. Or the virus per se may directly affect different organs, for example, the liver, the brain, heart and to trigger a phenomenon called apoptosis. These cells are going to release also different substances such as complement or activate the complement pathway, cytokines release, and these can affect the endothelium directly after a period of two or three year days of evolution. What are the, the problems that dengue can produce. First is the immune status. All people who have comorbidities, diabetes, obesity, cardiopathy, neuropathy, pregnant women may develop a different response and an aggressive response by the viral infection and may suffer complications. The other is the circulation of the strains. We know that when all, all the virus can cause severe or deadly disease, when there's one single strain circulating, the infections may not be not that complicated at the beginning, but with the circulation of the virus, this can become more serious and increase in complicated patients. However, where there's more the two strains of virus circulating that unfortunately that's a reality in many areas. This is called a state of hyperendemicity, complicates and favors the emergence of severe cases. In, in the black race, there seems to be a better response to infection and this is good. However, we also have other effects such as age. In the extreme ages of life, children under the age of one or the elderly, because of their immunosenescent state, they may have a poor immunological response and develop their age. That is a Rothman diagram that synthesizes what I mentioned. After the activation of T cell, there's a release of substances such as interferon, TNF, alpha, and this is going to affect the course 
of the evolution of the endothelium, the activity of the endothelium is going to favor the plasma leakage. And on top of this, the complement activation is also going to harm the endothelium. Well, that we mentioned of apoptosis is not affected. And this results that by compromising the endothelium, we have a decrease in the intravascular space. And this may complicate the hemodynamics of patient that but ultimately is going to complicate the evolution and may trigger shock this not treated adequately. That's more of the same, the activation of T cells. The cellular response is also important. And this is in participation of the endothelium. I've seen that Dr. Eric is going to show this graph. But you can see that on the second or third day, you see this endothelial damage and the leak of fluid going to generate the hemodynamic complications. Where, what causes this dengue severity? In 2004 in Cuba, there was, we held a meeting and we saw that the 97 classification was not that efficient when we analyze the cases of patients with dengue. And this is an international group with Dr. Osvaldo and Dr. Eric Martinez. We carry out a multicenter study where we an analyze almost 1,800 cases of dengue. And we saw that in the cases of dengue, plasma extravasation is the most frequent cause of severity of patients. When this extravasation evolves, it favors circulatory failure and shock. And here we see how the cases with plasma extravasation predominant, and when there is hemodynamic failure, patients may bleed, and these are the patients that are severe. And another important topic that sometimes we forget is the organ dysfunction that may be at the in brain, in the heart, lungs, kidney, bone marrow, intestine, etc., and may not give the manifestation that we usually see in patients, but these are complicated cases of dengue. And this is the one that we reported as severe cases. The DENCO study was started in 2005 to 2008 and was a study supported by the European Union and was trying to establish a mechanism for a better classification of patients. It's, we think that the previous 1997 dengue classification was difficult to manage by the diagnosis depend on the laboratory. That is not always present everywhere. Classification was made at the end of the disease. This made the clinical management of the patient quite difficult. Here we can see the array of the infections by dengue, which we talk about the asymptomatic 80 to 90 percent. The, the asymptomatic that can be patients without signs of alarm or with signs of alarm and severe dengue. And groups of dengue with or without alarm signs occur around the, between 3 to 7% of infections, and severe dengue is around 3%, 3 to 5% of symptomatic cases. This is what we are facing. The, the new revised classification, we were looking for a classification easy to use, where we could define if a patient has dengue or not, and if it has dengue, if it was severe or not, and not severe, 
to control for alarm signs, and if it was serious or severe, to look at the presentation. And this allows us to provide a follow-up to the patient and to establish intervention measures so patients don't die. In this study, we analyzed the cases with the previous classification. We saw that 40% of the patients could not be classified. And this leaves us quite a disadvantage. If we add hematocrit, we did a slight improvement of the classification, but there was still around 20% of patients that were not classified. With this new classification, very quickly, we can define in a significant way the cases with mild, moderate, and severe dengue cases. And we can see how in the proportions of the unclassified cases were severe, and this favored the now following the patients. And we also looked at when do we start seeing patients severity. We mentioned that starting on the day two, and this is this followed the observation of measuring the symptoms of severity in patients. And we see that at the end of the second day and start of the third day, we start to see an increase of symptoms, of severe symptoms that decreases around the seventh day. So we establish an initial phase called febrile phase, a critical phase that we see here. And we see it more pronouncedly when we add two symptoms. In that case, we know why the febrile phase and the critical phase, and that allowed us to see and follow the patients in the better uh, conditions. We look at the hematocrit, and we observe in all cases that there was a hemoconcentration and plasma leak starting on second day. Here we see it with the graphs overlap. We see that on the second day, approximately, we see this phase of plasma extravasation or plasma leaks through the endothelium. And this has an effect on the hematocrit determination. Platelets that are so feared by us. We see how they drop at the end of the second day or start of the third day in mild cases and moderate and severe. And we see that we, we've superimposed the three graphs. We see that in all cases, there's a drop in platelets, but in all cases, they recover without the need of addition of platelets. We need to not fear how we manage patients with this condition. This is a graph by Dr. Rosilu. We see what happens with the patient with dengue. After the fever appears, in this period, the patient is quite symptomatic, has myalgia, atralgia, headache, and some nausea, some abdominal pain. The patient shows an increase in the loss of fluid intake, and this favors something that is very important, which is dehydration. When the temperature falls, when we call up of the of the fever, is where we find a loss of fluids to the and we can see an increase in hematocrit. And here is where the patient can start having hemodynamic failure, which is going to be discussed later by Dr. Osvaldo and Dr. Eric. In this case, the patients may, after the fever has dropped with hypothermia or normal temperature. And finally, on the day five or seven, the patient has fever again. We need to remember that in the febrile phase is the, where we're going to find the virus in blood, where through tests we can identify the type of virus in different tests that 
detect viruses. Or later, we're going to have a positive result for the immunoglobulin test IgM, which is detected earlier around the fourth or fifth day, and IgG, which is going to be detected after day seven, and can give us an idea of what's happening with the patient. So we said that dengue is a systemic and dynamic disease, maybe asymptomatic, which is most of the cases, or when they are symptomatic, they may have mild symptoms, the flu-like syndrome, similar to an influenza, patient with mild manifestations, or the patient with severe or serious manifestations. Important to take into consideration when we take care of our patients. So it is clear that a patient has a febrile phase, has a critical phase, and after day seven, all the fluids that leaked, if the patient came at this stage of leak, they go from the interstitial space to the intravascular space, and patients recover. Most of them with no sequelae, and they go back to their normal life. So in the febrile day, we see how it lasts. This is where we're going to find the viruses. In the clinical signs are fever, body aches, arthralgia, myalgia. We may see rash with pruritus from head to feet. We may have digestive symptoms, and nausea and abdominal pain, and sometimes diarrhea. And here, this loss of fluids because of decrease of intake or an increase in losses due to fever is going to favor the de dehydration. It's very important to start with hydration solutions in order to treat the patient and to monitor vital signs. We have to detect the very risk factors such as age, comorbidity, social factors, and pregnancy that have to be managed in a more special way with a more intense follow-up. And then we have the critical uh, phase where we're going to find signs and symptoms of involvement of the hemodynamic with tachycardia, weak holes, cold extremities, a pulse pressure shortening. And in the case of patients with dengue who have fluid leak, this is going to shorten. And occasionally we can have mild bleedings, but in, in cases that we're going to see later, bleeding from mucosas may represent a sign of alarm. And finally, if the patient can produce hypovolemic shock, and this activates the coagulation cascade and affect different organs and complications. So initially, in, we're going to find facial redness, erythema, general body pain, myalgia, atrophia, headache, and another is a retroorbital pain, which in, in arboviral disease. You can find different uh, bleeding phenomena such as petechiae, which are not alarm signs, epistaxis, or bleeding in mucosas. They have to be documented because this is a sign of alarm, like hematemesis, metorrhagia, and bleeding by benefunctocyte. In the digestive system, the patient stops eating, may present nausea and vomiting, and sometimes hepatromegaly. Sore throat, conjunctival erythema, or hyperemia. And we also seen a relative bradycardia in febrile phase. And if we take early lab, we want to find leukopenia, so the virus enters into the bone marrow and produces, in case of meloptysis, there's a decrease in production of platelets, leukocytes, and erythrocytes. 
and this is very important. We find leukocytes under 1,000 in a febrile case. The suggestive may help to orient. So, the patient that has fever and symptoms that we have reviewed may be a patient without warning signs. Patient who has warning signs, which are listed here, is a patient that First of all, we need to identify and provide follow-up because that patient is going to have hemodynamic problems and may give rise to circulatory failure and shock. The severe dengue is listed here, patient who has the presence of severe bleeding or shock or respiratory distress and severe organ involvement has to be considered as group of severe dengue. At the end of the second day, it's part of the third day, we see the critical phase, and there is a group of symptomatic patients that are three to 5% may have severe manifestations. Many of them are expression of extravasation of fluids or inadequate management. Followed, I mentioned before that many patients come late and this should not be the The patient has these symptoms, tachycardia, weak pulse, cold extremities, pale skin, prolonged capillary filling, that talks about circulatory failure, a shortening of pulse pressure, on mean arterial pressure less than 74 adults, and may have some manifestations of bleeding are listed here. And something important is this heart involvement because one out of six patients with severe dengue, according to reports, may have myocarditis, may cause problems when we treat the patients. Patients may have elevation of transaminases at the liver level. When they go over 1,000, we talk about talking about a severe case. It's a coagulation time increase, and the leukocyte response is also important. In addition, patients may develop uh, this imbalance in glucose levels, and this may affect the obese patients or patients with, and this favors, as we mentioned, a significant I'm going to emphasize on warning signs. These were described in Cuba by Dr. Francisco Zamora and Professor Eric Martinez, who is one of the speakers today, and have been reviewed in different papers with the DELCO group. They were validated, and there's a recent a document by PAHO, which provides an important value for the detection and the evolution of the patient with severe dengue. First are alarm signs that alert the clinician about the possibility of severe dengue are between the third and seventh day in their inspection of the asthma extravasation and they have been backed by several scientific studies. Severe abdominal pain or pain on palpation. It may be caused by congestion at abdominal level in the gallbladder, intestine, in different cavities in the abdomen. Do not respond to analgesics, and we can identify Sound that records this fluid leak, the gold bladder level as well as the intestine with the present edema, and this may be differential diagnosis of a blue abdomen. Presence of persistent vomit, three or more in one hour, or more than four in six hours. It's important. It prevents an adequate oral hydration and the accumulation of fluids and cavities, abdomen, 
thorax around the heart that may be detected clinically or with ultrasound or images that is going to help us to identify other alarm signs. Mucosal bleeding are the areas where we're going to detect them. PTK and chemosis are not alarm signs. Alarm signs are mucosal bleeding. And this is very important to identify because the, the alteration of the conscious state with somnolence in children or in cases of adults, we can see a state of somnolence or coma from this a factor caused by hypovolemia. Another alarm sign is postural hypotension. And we have to remember that the patient with dengue doesn't see look toxic when we have, when they start being severe cases. But if we, if this patient is sitting down, we ask him to stand up, he may fall. Or if it's laying down and we ask him to sit, it may fall. It's an early sign of hypovolemia and we will have to look for it. In the case of children, we can establish a liver greater than two centimeters below the coastal ridge and a progressive increase in hematocrit. With the previous classification, we discussed it was 20% in relation to hemoglobin hematocrit. With the new classification, a trend to elevate hematocrit is sufficient for us to document. We remember that we need to provide follow-up because hemoglobin and hematocrit is quite different in women, in men, and in age groups. So we have to compare that with the record we have available. The patient with severe dengue, we already mentioned, patient who has significant bleeding or a severe involvement of organs. Severe bleeding are Multiple can occur in the brain, the thorax, in the abdomen. Many of them are come with circulatory failure with organ damage. Some medications can cause bleeding, such as NSAIDs, aspirin. And remember that thrombocytopenia is not a cause of severe bleeding. When we see the fall in platelets, this tells us that the immunologic state is active and this is a in the platelet count. But we have patients with normal platelet count with hemodynamic failure. And this is associated with shock, with severe thrombocytopenia without any bleeding. Here we see a patient with a severe form of dengue. We can find a, this is a graph of Dr. Eric Martinez, stole it from him to show the platelets. The levels start falling, and after the leak, fluid leak phase, they recover without the need of transfusion. So the patient may be asymptomatic up to severe cases, and we need to identify the patient at the different phases or stages to establish the different treatment modalities. I'm going to focus on the febrile stage. And remember, oral hydration. There are studies that when we start early management with oral hydration in patients in this stage, they tolerate better the fluid leakage and you prevent crowding, overcrowding of hospitals. The management for critical stage is going to be talked later. We think that dengue can affect different organs. And finally, the diagnosis through laboratory may be by direct methods where we can have viral isolation, genome detection, or detection of the antigen. We usually do it by detection of the antigen, NS1, 
In some countries, we do that the for chikungunya and Zika together with dengue, or by RT-PCR, we can identify the genome and what serotype is circulating. Evidence. With the use of indirect methods, the IgM levels initially, and then, which it becomes positive early, and then IgG. In secondary cases or second infections, we can have an initial increase in IgG together with IgM. And it has to be taken into consideration. Viral phase, identify critical phase, identify recovery phase that is going to be described later on. And this is my presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Excellent presentation of the Martinez. Very important what you have mentioned to learn more in detail how to face the problem of the complications of dengue. What you underline is the value of the immune response and the impact in the hemodynamics of patients that are affected especially those who have comorbidities and pregnant women. We have an important number of questions and I would ask you to please stay in the room so we can you can answer them. Very kind, Dr. Jose Guadalupe Martinez. Now, we invite Dr. Osvaldo Enrique Castro Peraza. Dr. Castro Peraza, doctor in medicine from the University of Havana, Cuba, and has a second degree specialist in internal medicine, master in infectious diseases and tropical diseases, he is Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and is currently Head of the Medicine and Outpatient Service of the Pedro Curi Institute of Tropical Medicine. He's a member of several committees and societies, such as the Committee of Experts of the National Vaccine Development Program, the Cuban Society of Internal Medicine, the Cuban Society of Microbiology and Parasitology the National Commission for Discussion of Death in Epidemiological Emergencies, in TAP, and the National Commission for Discussion of ARB Treatment from IPK. It has more than 30 years dedicated to care, teaching, and research related to the study of infectious diseases, particularly with the subject of arbovirus. Professor of Internal Medicine, and of the Masters of Infectious Diseases Program and has participated in clinical trials of vaccines and drugs. In research, he has provided advice through MINSAP and Pan American Health Organization to several countries of the Americas region, both in teaching and in dealing with dengue epidemics. He has participated in more than 100 international congresses, courses, in workshops to provide lectures on clinical and case management of dengue and other ivoviruses. More than 50 published articles related to the study of infectious diseases. He has worked in the drafting of guiding documents and case management guidelines for Cuba, some countries of the region, and the Pan American Health Organization. Dear Dr. Osvaldo Enrique Castro Peraza, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Yes, go ahead. We're going to start the presentation 
asking a question. Why do why do people why do patients die? We have estimated in the diagnosis and knowledge on the clinical but we've seen the presentation of Dr. Guadalupe. However, despite that, if we look at the document of the Pan American Health Organization, patients are still dying with dengue. So there is It's a systemic disease, dynamic disease. Most of the cases are not serious. There are some risk factors. The virus is going to, we need to consider this basic concept. Where are we failing? Why do we see severe cases? And why many patients died with these complications? There's a significant increase in capillary permeability starts as early as the second or third day of fever. And there's an increase in permeability, clinical expression. So we're talking this. We see plasma extravasation in the part of the critical phase. What happens where there's an increase in this permeability, there's a leak of fluid and goes out of the intravascular space. And it is of great magnitude that overcomes the patient's compensatory mechanisms. We have this systemic circulatory insufficiency. We see the shock, shock state. And this will depend on the magnitude as we see this fluid extravasation. And here we see the, the systemic sucratory insufficiency, which is the most important cause of severity of those patients. To understand what's happening and The quality of the sound is very difficult to interpret. We're having problems with this um, sound. Sorry, no interpretation. Cuando ya el enfermo está hipotenso, es un enfermo que lleva de 2 a 4 horas en insuficiencia circulatoria. 
y por lo tanto el manejo es mucho más complicado. En esta etapa de plan, donde aún la tensión es más normal, podemos encontrar la caña, lluvia, muy importante la diversidad. Pero si el millón, la anterior a pena, son una de las primeras comprometidas, igual que la de tubo y el tipo, igual que la de Matiel, algo que es sabio de Galil, para mantener el flujo de sangre, vamos a llamar hospital. Pero entonces la presencia de Sergio y Oluria son el elemento de importancia en el fallo de la sociedad. ¿Para qué pasa el ruido? Y es que el caso de la. Estimado doctor Osvaldo, eh, le pido mil disculpas por la. Interrupción. Creo Pardon, que... I apologize for the intervention. I think we could have better audio if you are using the microphone of the computer. We are losing your valuable information, dear doctor. I'm going to switch places. Yes, please. Yes, go ahead, please. Do you need me to go back in some slide? Yes, perhaps a couple of slides. Ingeniero. 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 Listo. Muy amable, yeah. doctor. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Well, I was explaining that when the plasma extravasation starts, we see hypovolemia, contraction of the blood volume, and this generates the stimulation of what called compensatory mechanism. Mechanisms in the systemic nerv sympathetic nervous system, endocrine system, central nervous systems that try to retain water and salt by kidneys in contraction of arterioles, the increase of total peripheral resistance. All of this in order to maintain blood pressure in normal range and to guarantee the circulation to vital organs. And there, we always say that hypotension is a late sign of shock because a patient in circulatory failure, even with normal blood pressure, may be having severe consequences for hemodynamics. What happens later? There's a stage where shock causes more shock. How do we understand this? The patient with circulatory failure, we're going to have weakening of compensatory mechanisms and there's a myocardial depression, vasomotor insufficiency. Instead of contracting the arterioles, there's vasodilation, greater uh, impairment of microcirculation, cellular metabolism, is involved in this a metabolic acidosis, a lactic acidosis. And this, what I'm saying, is what we normally see, we see in critical patients. There's more blood agglutination. There's an increase in capillary permeability due to tissue hypoxia with a leakage of fluid. And this makes hypovolemia even worse. And our physicians get frustrated because they provide volume but the patient doesn't recover hemodynamics, even by administering large amounts of fluids to the intravascular space. And therefore, the patient, little by little, holds in a state of irreversible shock. Why I tell you this story? Because if we are not able to identify early the 
fluid leakage and replace those losses as soon as possible. And the patient has a prolonged shock of several hours, the patient may fall in a state of irreversible shock and therefore we will not be able to do anything for them. Some key elements of the patient management. We have a lot of knowledge, the best guidelines, but if we don't comply with these four pillars, we will not be able to be successful in preventing death by dengue. First is training. Any of all the medical and nursing personnel that treats patients with dengue needs to be trained. When I talk about the all the medical staff, not only clinicians and primary health care physicians, but also surgeons, gynecol GOI, and all of those who have to work with these patients, there's patients who end up in the ORs due to diagnostic errors and due to a poor training. So training has to be for all. Education of the population not and participation in self-care. We regret many times that we lost life because the patients come late to the health system. So it is instrumental that the family and patients collaborate with medical care and ask and seek care early to prevent this late diagnosis and the late interventions. To have a practical classification of cases, including the signs of alarm, a very important element to do with the reorganization of medical services to deal with epidemics. This seems something simple, but if we don't have these four pillars, not and with the, the best physicians or best intensivists will be able to prevent patients dying. So what do we need to do first? Every time we face a case, we need to consider the major question. Is it dengue? Has comorbidities? What phase of dengue fever? Are there warning signs? What is the hemodynamic and hydration status? Does it have shock? And this allows to classify patients in the four groups that we know so far. These four groups are group A, but those that can be sent home, B1, to be observed and treated in the dengue unit at the first level of care. Group B2, that goes to the dengue unit and hospitals for second level, which are the patients who have warning signs in the C, those who require emergency treatment. Now to summarize treatment, we're not going to review the guidelines it is clear that a group B1 that still doesn't have signs of plasma extravasations has other conditions, either comorbidities or special conditions must be managed in dengue unit to guarantee oral hydration. And if this is not possible, use with intravenous solutions. This patient needs to be observed very closely, or even if they haven't presented any evidence of extravasation. For the group B2 who have warning signs, it is when you decide, decide everything. When the fluid starts to leak and volemia is going down, we need to administer fluid as soon as possible so that volemic is recovered. And this can be achieved after many analysis and reviews and experienced by the group of experts, starting with a dose of 10 milliliters per kilo per hour. In the stage of signs of alarm, we can guarantee that to the extent that the liquid is leaking, we can replace those losses and we can maintain an adequate bulimia and prevent the contraction and shock. This we can repeat it if there's no improvement. And if we see an improvement, then we start reducing the volume because as we previously mentioned and Guadalupe explained, this plasma extravasation lasts for 24 to 48 hours. Therefore, we don't need much more time for hydration in order to have the patients recover. If the patient continues improving, the alarm sign disappear, we discontinue hydration, and then our patient 
spend all this critical stage with with plus nice conversation, but they were able to preserve their hemodynamics or volume. So we see the severity of dengue can be prevented. Now we can have that the patient doesn't improve with a dose of 10 mils per kilo, kilograms. So we can use higher doses of 20 milliliters per kilo. And some recommend higher doses, but be very careful because the overhydration, especially in a patient with special conditions, may be very dangerous. Therefore, we consider, consider to be very careful in the managing the fluid administration following the recommendations. Now that the patient with severe dengue, who unfortunately comes in shock, that has a reduction of significant reduction of bulimia with a loss of one liter in an adult, that's five liters. That loss of one liter of plasma reduces the bulimia to four liters, and therefore it creates a significant hemodynamic state. So recovery has to be quick, fast, and we recommend they use the same crystalloid solutions, but at 20 milliliters per kilo in bolus to recover bulimia as soon as possible. And many times, this is enough for the patient to come out of this hemodynamic uh, complication and we can start to reduce hydration to 10 mils per kilo. There's much difference to what we do in pediatric patients. So perhaps Eric will talk about these aspects, but this is what saves the life to a patient to early and quick bulimia recovery. It is a bad practice to, to use crystallized solutions, not in bolus, but for four or eight hours. This is a severe mistake because what we're trying the patient recover bulimia as soon as possible. Circulatory insufficient needs to be recovered as soon as possible, and therefore we do not continue with this metabolic impairment of the patient. Now, despite that, we could have a failure. We administer two, three solutions, but the patient continues with unstable vital signs. So there are other measures that Eric is going to mention. We always say between two and three doses of 20 mils per kilo, we're talking about almost half of the blood volume. Therefore, if this patient has not responded to the administration of fluid, we need to evaluate and determine the pump, the rule out my myocarditis and the use of or inotropic and vasoactive drugs. This is a moment to consider the exceptional administration of some colloid solution. Exceptional, I mentioned, because so the crystalloid solutions, that one of choice to treat patients with dengue. To evaluate the presence of metabolic acidosis and the risk of occult bleeding that may be complicated. Okay. This is simple. Sometimes, or every time we make a presentation, we uh, are expecting somebody administers a new drug or a new strategy, but this is not the case. This we need to follow knowledge and be able to understand what it means as a patient with dengue, which is a reduced polymia due to loss of plasma, and we need to recover them as soon as possible. And so simple with crystalloid solutions are the dose that we recommend. Now, very quickly, I'm going to show you our experience in IPK in a study with 1,439 hospitalized patients, the epidemi different epidemiological moments where the sample was made up of adult of white race with a mean age of 37. And the first important element is 
that of 43 severe cases, 41, reached severity due to plasma extravasation, due to shock. It was not organ failure or bleeding. The one case of severe bleeding, and unfortunately someone, some patient who had two big, large ultic, uh, peptic ulcers that bled on the sixth day of disease, of this disease in a case with encephalitis, with apparently, because we're not pretty sure if it was a case of encephal encephalopathy due to hypoxia, but in this patient, we didn't demonstrate any plasma extravasation, and therefore it was closed as a case of encephalopathy. But most of them had shock due to plasma extravasation, and we'll see why they went to shock. The alarm signs, the most important when the ones that we know. Mucosal bleeding, abdominal pain were the most prevalent. Continuous vomiting or repeated vomiting. But I want to show you in this graph, our patient went into shock with a mean of 4.9. So most of the patients went to shock on day five of the disease. This is the line that we are representing here in the graph. Before shock occurs, we had these alarm signs more frequently. Somnolence, increasing hematocrit, abdominal pain, bleeding, repeated vomiting. What is in this graph and document, we could see in this study. However, the pleural effusion were more delayed. So although these are evidence, evident signs of fluid extravasation, they're not helpful in trying to be ahead of the complications because when we detected the extravasation of fluid has already occurred. This other graph, rep, there's a better representation. These are the days of the emergence of alarm signs. But if they, the and you can see that the alarm signs, all of them start between 24 and 48 hours before the shock. So it's extremely important. So they help us, as I previously mentioned, to be ahead of what's going to occur, which is more insufficiency. This intense abdominal pain, the earliest one. And there's not difference with the pediatric patient, but when you have a patient with dengue, that on second, third day starts with abdominal pain, we need to start acting. Second place, we have repeated vomiting and bleeding in women, the vaginal bleeding and the neurological symptoms. We're talking about irritability, lethargy, somnolence, are the, alarm, the earliest alarm signs in the later ones are the mucosal bleeding. So perhaps they can help us a little bit more. Now, the duration of the alarm sign, almost all of them last 24 to 48 hours. So after you start to treat it, especially abdominal pain, is treated with administration of fluid, similar to what happens with the vo vomiting. Summarizing, mucosal bleeding, abdominal pain, asthenia, repeated vomiting are the most prevalent and most frequent, and they show levels of sensitivity that are quite high. The negative predictive value are extremely high. So the absence of them, we're going to see are indicators that a patient is not going to become more complicated. It's summarizing what I just mentioned. When we calculate sensitivity and specificity, we see that the likelihood of alarm signs within those who are severe is 100%. 100% of patients who were severe had alarm signs, but the probability of a patient does not get severe, if it doesn't have any signs of alarm, it's 100%. So this demonstrates the 
at to follow a patient with dengue in the fever stage with early identification of alarm signs and start adequate treatment perhaps is the key that we want to need. This is what I want to mention. In 2002, we did a prospective study with a follow-up of cases. We had six cases of shock. Of the six cases of shock, one, none of those who had shock received what we call a timely treatment. None of them received it. It asked me many times, well, why were not treated adequately? Because those are the ones that arrive late to the hospital. All those who receive adequate treatment with alarm signs had a good evolution. So we arrived to the conclusion that 100% of severe cases who do not receive timely treatment, and we look and study those who die and those who are severe, we always find mistakes and errors in the management. But however, 98% of those treated adequately did not work, got worsened their conditions on adequate treatment with the signs of alarms, perhaps is the key of success. Therefore, with this, I'm going to end my presentation. The dengue shock is available. If we know the, the significant increase in capillary permeability is one of the important signs and with the signs of alarm and this need to start with the critical stage and the early identification allowed us to take an immediate therapeutic behavior. This can prevent death. And we arrived to the conclusion that death by dengue and shock by dengue can be preventable. With this, I finish. And I think that after we hear from Eric Martinez, he's going to complement what I have mentioned and perhaps we can answer some questions later on to my colleagues who are listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osvaldo Castro Peraza. It's been an excellent presentation with very interesting data and the wealth of experience in terms of the care of dengue, severe dengue. And I consider it too important to underline what you mentioned at the end. Death by the cases of dengue is avoidable. For that, we need to activate or improve or support the initiative of the Ministry of Health in the Andean region, in this case, regards training of all the medical and nurse, nursing staff regard with the important need to provide information to the population and a practical classification of the patients so we can classify them by risks and also to reordering of the health systems to face the outbreaks. Thank you very much, dear doctor. Please remove, stay in the room because we have a large number of questions. Now we invite Dr. Eric Martinez Torres. Professor Eric Martinez is a MD. PhD and SCDR has been a pediatrician dedicated to teaching and research in the field of infectious diseases in children, particularly dengue, for more than 30 years. As an international consultant for the Pan American Health Organization, he has been working in 19 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean during epidemics or teaching dengue court or seminars. And for one year, he was part of the PAHO class in Brasilia, in Brazil, advisor to the Ministry of Health. He was one of the authors of the chapter on clinical management of the guidelines of the diagnosis, treatment, and control of dengue in 2009, edited by the World Health Organization and of the guidelines for the management of dengue patients, edited 
by Pan American Health Organization in 2010, the coordinator for Latin America of the International Denko Project, which resulted in the proposal of a new dengue classification, which is now the one recommended by WHO and is present in all normative documents. Of He is also a member of Data Security Board for the new WHO polio vaccines in Geneva. He was director of research and development at the Cuban Ministry of Health. In the last 18 years, he has been part of the Department of the Pedro Curie Institute Tropical of Tropical Medicine, mainly dedicated to doctoral training, as well as the end of the research ethics committee. He is author of 120 papers and books on dengue published in Cuba, Dominican Republic, Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil. He has made about 400 at local, national, and international scientific events in 20 countries. A member of the Pan American Association of Infectious Diseases, Latin American Society of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, Cuban Society of Pediatrics, and other Latin American scientific societies. He is a member of the Cuban Academy of Sciences. Go ahead, dear doctor. Eric Martinez Torres, you have the floor. In order to facilitate your presentation, dear doctor, we're going to we're going to are you going to make the presentation? Yes, we we can we can take care of that from here. Go ahead. Well, greetings to everyone. Perhaps the audience is not tired, but has received a lot of information by the two brilliant colleagues that have preceded me. What are the severe forms of dengue? We were asked to talk about the treatment of severe dengue in children. So, this picture was taken by Dr. Guadalupe Martinez in the epidemic that we together worked in El Salvador in the year 2000. And it shows what are the severe forms of dengue. The most frequent is shock, it has been mentioned. Associated to that, we have respiratory distress or major bleedings and organ involvement, such as the heart, the brain, liver, and others. Emphasis in the last phrase, more than 90% of severe dengue cases are due to hypovolemic shock. This is what the most frequent one. This slide was already shown by Guadalupe, but it shows how through the endothelial vessel, we see the leakage of plasma that is produced by a number of substances released by monocytes, and it's also associated to loss of red cells and bleeding and migration of leukocytes that's going to influence in other cells and macrophages who will also release more cytokines, chemokines. And we see this is the essence of the severity. This is how we explain in a very summarized why do we see plasma leakage, extravasation. I'm not talking about inflammation, so we don't get confused to what we show later with COVID-19. Plasma extravasation rather than bleeding, more than rather than bleeding, because we use this word of hemorrhagic dengue that made us believe 
that the severity was due to bleeding. But the, it depends by observation more than bleeding, the major determinant of more cases of severe dengue. In which, of course, associated to a significant increase of hematocrit in accumulation of fluid in serous cavities. This is an example. Hydrothorax in a patient, and unfortunately, you look at the right, how the lung was of that patient the patient in the autopsy, how the plasma extravasation led to all of this. This is an image of the cold bladder. You can see that thickness that the wall of the cold bladder has, has that leak, leak, more on this. But I show you, so you can see that there is no inflammation. It's just plasma extravasation. But if you talk the word cholecystitis, it's not correct. There's no itis, no inflammatory component. It has been the cause of more than one patient that was taken to the OR. Bleeding, the major bleeding are seen more frequently during prolonged shock. As it was previously mentioned, bleeding is not necessarily related to the intensity of thrombocytopenia. And here we go in the organ involvement. Severe hepatitis due to dengue. This is not frequent, but of the organ involvement is one of the most frequent and the management of all viral hepatitis. Hepatitis by dengue doesn't have a specific treatment or different, as we can see with renal involvement with dengue, that with renal involvement with the, you can see the edema in this child. So the organ involvement to the dengue virus can be managed as you manage other organ involvements produce other viruses or causes. The same with myocarditis or the CNS, encephalitis with dengue. Be careful with myocarditis with dengue. Every day is reported more frequently of this involvement by dengue of course, it also depends on what are the resources that we have for its study. When we have the EKG, we diagnose part of it, but other studies with enzymes can achieve a much higher diagnosis of patients with dengue that have in myocardial involvement. We are telling us for clinicians, we need to know and be following the patient's course. A patient who has bradycardia or there's an unexplained impairment of cardiac rhythm, we may think that a patient with myocarditis with them. And same with the central nervous system. Now the question, what do patients with dengue die of? Can we prevent this death? This is a study made in El Salvador in the year 2000 in its current. Several countries that were called to work there with Guadalupe, us. When we arrived, there were 30 children died to dengue. What do they die of from? There you see, these are the days, first, second, third, fourth day, and four more days. If you see, all those who die the first three days had shock. Some of them with respiratory distress, 
some others with major bleeding, and some with EID. All of them had shock. So it ratifies what I mentioned before, that shock is the most frequent way of, uh, form of severity. And if we were able to prevent shock or uh, manage it adequately, we could prevent respiratory distress, major bleeding, and multi-organ failure, etc. The Brazilian girl had dengue with three days of fever and pain. But on the, on the fourth day, she had no fever, but with some abdominal pain. And the mother brought her to the doctor. They didn't find anything. And next time, the mother went home with pain treatment. And 11 hours later, the girl was like this. It was a dengue and the abdominal pain were the alarm signs. It was telling to that physician that it was time to act. And you can eight, 10 hours later, the girl with everything that was there, bleeding, a liver greater than 10 centimeters below the coastal margin, with organ involvement, bleeding, everything, because the plasma extravasation that was initial was not diagnosed and treated adequately. Incorrect to say that dengue and severe dengue have no treatment. The knowledge, as Dr. Castro mentioned, the knowledge is the first step of treatment. And training of the staff, and education to the community. The population has the right to know about this, but in addition, the reordering, reorganization of the services. If a, a child comes with an alarm sign, and have to ask who's the last one in a waiting room. It's not a case because it will fall in shock and die before being taken care of. That is part of the reorganization of the health systems, health services need during the dengue outbreaks. That's why we say that in a country or region, at the same time, the aim is to control the vector, stop or reduce the transmission of the infection and avoid epidemics we need to prevent. Because the life of a child is very valuable. No one should die from dengue. We should add, or almost no one. Because today we've seen especially in the cardiovascular system, that some patients, there's an intense involvement of the myocardium that can generate the death of the patient without us being much for the patient. But perhaps this small amount, it we should, the idea that no one should die from dengue. Although even if we don't have an antiviral drug or I will have a vaccine. We don't have strong technology, but we have the so-called soft technology. That knowledge has been said to be effective to manage patients. I don't, when I show the 30 children died in El Salvador, when the visiting group got together and we went out and in three days we re we visited the entire country and we trained all the departments of the country. There was no more single death. What do we do? So what do we do? What to do? The questions are here. Ask ourselves, 
can have to ask, what stage of dengue fever are you in? That needs to be improved. So the first questions need to have an epidemiological context. So we need to ask the clinic. But first is, where has the patient been? Where it comes from? Where, where it lives? Are other cases of dengue? So have a epidemiological criteria. We're going to see that in the case of children, not always the clinical case is complete. The clinical presentation is complete. So the Pan American Health Organization agreed that when a small child lives in an area where there's a dengue outbreak and has fever, it has to be considered it has dengue even though it doesn't have the complete clinical characteristics. And the question to what stage of dengue, do you have warning signs? Is it in shock? Do you have comorbidities? And if it requires hospitalization or not? These last two were mentioned by the people who treated me. They can be sent to their homes, the patient who can tolerate adequate volumes of oral fluids, urinate at least once every six hours. Do not present alarm signs. The matter is stable. It do not have other coexisting conditions. Sometimes they can go home and they have to go through a bridge or a river. So it's a social risk that forced me to not to send him home or a social risk because the person who takes care is alcoholic or something similar. So the patient without warning signs and associated conditions. First and foremost important is oral hydration. Maintain breastfeeding, oral fluids. Watch for warning signs. And of course, mosquito net. And it's difficult with the heat, very difficult to keep patients with mosquito net. It's doing the febrile phase, vital signs, and provide painkillers, the paracetamol type, or dipirone, as is currently being done. When to hospitalize those with severe abdominal pain or repeated vomiting, those are the two alarm signs that are most frequent in children and adults. But you also have profuse sweating, lipotemia, hypotension, coldness, or bleeding, hemoconcentration, chest pain, cyanosis, which always indicates severity. What behavior to follow according to the patient's severity? Well, big, these are warning signs. Intense and sustained abdominal pain, very frequent abundant vomiting, sudden drop in temperature, hypothermia, with irritability, drowsiness, which means cerebral hypoxia and progressive increasing hematocrit. The treatment with liquid should start on the site where the warning signs are diagnosed. What do I mean by this? I don't have to wait four or six hours because an ambulance can transfer the patient, transport that patient to a hospital, and I lose those precious hours. We need to start treatment with intravenous solutions where the warning signs are diagnosed because the most important thing is to prevent shock. With what? Administer crystal solutions immediately at 10 mils per kilo in the first hour, or Ringer's lactate, or normal saline solution. Because dengue can kill your patient in a short time. Don't waste any time, because dengue can kill your patient before you treat it. With alarm signs, crystal is 10 mils per kilo, Reevaluate clinical improvement in diuresis, continue reducing the fluids, or there's alarm signs in diuresis 
less than one mil per kilo per hour. We repeat the crystalloid load. And clinical improvement is a progressive disappearance of alarm signs, stable vital signs, normal or increased diuresis, decreasing hematocrit, good oral, oral tolerance and recovery of appetite. Now, if clinical improvement continues, reduce the amount progressively and then continue a low dose of fluids because the oral route is adequate. At all patient that is hospitalized will be observed for chills, cyanosis, narrowing of the pulse pressure because the goal is the early treatment of shock. The initial phase of shock is a weak and rapid pulse called extremities, a capillary feeling greater than two seconds, reticular lividity or mothering of the skin, narrowing of differential arterial pressure between the maximum and the minimum, because as it has been mentioned, Hyterial hypotension is a late sign of shock. If we ask our colleague or a medical student, what's a shock? They're going to respond in a patient that has hypotension. But no, you're wrong. When the patient has hypotension, that's the hours before the patient had some insufficiency. Not wait hypotension to diagnose shock try to diagnose it in the initial phase. So the treatment of shock, 20 mils per kilo, every 15 to 30 minutes. Oxygen, admission to intensive care unit, and reevaluate. If signs of shock disappear, reduce volume in clinical improvement continues, reduce two just maintenance, but signs may persist of hemodynamic instability. In that case, you go to the right to repeat the load of crystalloids can be done one or two more times, but hemodynamic instability, maintain we can change to colloids, as Dr. Castro mentioned, to 10 to 20 mils per kilo in 30 to 60 minutes and define the use a means is the possibility of hynotropic agents to improve myocardial function. No corticosteroids or heparins are usually indicated in the management of dengue. We, we insist in this because COVID, during the COVID, patient, our physicians use anti-inflammatories and heparin for thrombosis, but this is not the case with dengue and dinotropic drugs when bulimia has been restored. Crystalloids are the choice, the management of choice for dengue shock. Colloid solutions only if they're considered strictly necessary. And the crystalloids at 20 mils, if there's persistence of hemodynamic instability or decrease in hematocrit or suggest bleeding, in that case, we can administer liquids adequately, but continue with hemodynamic instability. And there's a drop of hematocrit that suggests bleeding. This is the moment because you have to remember that hematocrit is increased in dengue. If the hematocrit falls, it's because the patient has bled. If they are compensated, this is the time for transfusion red blood cells or fresh blood. That's the time. This is the patient They're from Brazil. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Eric Martinez, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. And now we have time for some Q&A. At this moment, we have more than a thousand people following this valuable information provided through this webinar. And we're going to ask two questions to each one of you. And you can 
answer any question that you also consider pertinent for Dr. Jose Martinez. There are two questions. One of them indicates after how many days a person who had dengue can donate blood. And the second question is related to, could you clarify us about the diagnostic tests that are adequate according to the phases of the disease? Is there, are there any exceptions to this? Go ahead, Dr. Jose. Thank you very much for the questions. First of all, diagnosis. The diagnosis will depend in terms of the laboratory of what are our resources available. Ideally, we said that in the fever phase, when the virus is in blood, we should look the evidence of the virus. If we can establish the presence of virus, the presence of NS1 by ELISA techniques or NS1 through RT-PCR. Each country will have different capacities for diagnosis. However, here I would like to clarify that we don't need to have a positive test to start treatment. With clinical suspicions, suspicion, which is the most important, we will have to start treatment regardless that we have a positive or negative test for dengue, because sometimes these results take time and we cannot wait for this report in order to start treatment. Here I would like to emphasize that there are opportunities to start treatment. Something that is very important, as Dr. Osvaldo commented, is high. And many times patients die because we don't give them the care from the first moment that we see them. The febrile stage is the most symptomatic stage, and this is where the patients Big care when the patient has fever, myalgias, arthralgias, bad, and he goes to see the doctor. And many times the doctor says, "What are you doing here? Take a paracetamol." And there's some memes with this. Why am I going to go to visit the doctor if you're going to prescribe Tylenol? We need to switch that type of care in the patient. First of all, the physician. When a patient comes with a suspicion of dengue, the first thing that needs to do is a complete evaluation of the patient. Identify if there are comorbidities present, to establish in what clinical phase is the patient, and to identify the signs of alarm that do not need to be all present. One is sufficient to start managing the patient and the most important point here is the follow-up. We call it enzymatic therapy, to be on top of the patient. If we see the patient for the first time, we need to document the viral signs quite accurately and to establish and give the patient a, a printout with the alarm signs of so the patient can identify these uh, signs of alarm early. People are originally afraid of fever and goes six medical care to take the fever away. And we know that infectious diseases, when the fever disappears, there's an improvement of the patient. In dengue, that's not the case. The fall of temperature is a very important that starts a critical phase and this needs to be communicated to the patient or to the family member who's taking care of the patient so they can identify and take them for medical care. And the physician should be careful to provide a new evaluation and to identify the alarm signs and the signs of hemodynamic impairment. This is the secret so that the patients are going to go well. 
And here, remember that the patients in the febrile phase have, have dehydration, so we need to make sure that the patient is hydrated with oral rehydration salts or the hydration that we have in place. The publications and experiences show that if we treat patients from the first level, the second level hospitals don't suffer any overcrowding. And I want to take one minute to comment one of stories in 2008 in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, who has a very well developed hospital system. They bet to stop the dengue outbreak level. The hospital were overcrowded, saturated, and didn't work. There was an intervention team. We started treating patients in tents with oral rehydration, and the hospitalized case disappeared. So we need to consider that with Dr. Eric Martinez was telling us the experience that we had in El Salvador. Many children were dying, and there was a presidential order that all children with dengue were transferred to the children's specialized hospital. With a team from different countries, they made an effort that was successful where we train more than 3,500 physicians were trained, all the physicians in El Salvador, and other patients were managed in the site where they seek care. They were well treated and managed with these hydration techniques have already been mentioned, and children stopped dying. Patients stopped dying. We lost the fear of manage a patient with dengue because we know the pathophysiology. We saw that if they were treated adequately, go well. So this we be able to document in the man managing the dengue from the first level, even with intravenous treatment and with alarm signs that the patients are stable and do not reach hospitals. And this is very important. With regards to transfusion, I don't see a need someone donates blood. The virus is going to be present in the febrile phase. Remember that the patient may have hemodynamic problems between the days three and seven, and then we have the recovery phase. So we don't recommend that three weeks early, uh, later, that the patient donates blood because it may affect their hemodynamics and that could complicate their recovery. Thank you very much. Excellent responses. To Dr. Osvaldo Castro, there are two questions. One of them says, how to diagnose a case of asymptomatic case of dengue? What strategies would you recommend to apply in the case of outbreaks in extensive territories in order to avoid the under-registration and improve epidemiologic surveillance. And the second question, the elevation of antibodies doesn't generate any defenses. What is the difference with the vaccine? Go ahead, Dr. Castro. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, first question is somewhat complex. How to diagnose an asymptomatic case of dengue? Very difficult for a clinician that works with symptoms and signs. In this case, if there are no symptoms, there's no disease. Therefore, it's extremely complex. Of course, that we can we know that for every clinical case, there are 10 to 15 subclinical or asymptomatic. That's an epidemiological value, but I'll come back to value from the clinical. 
epidemiological because these persons infected are also going to transmit. But they don't have any probability that they're going to their life threatened because they don't have developed the disease. From the epidemiological point of view, they do have a value. Demonstrated that they contribute to the spread of the uh, epidemic. We always say that a mosquito, the one that transmits a disease, biting one pa patient to a susceptible, but the people are the ones who disseminate the epidemic with their mobility. So the asymptomatics are in epidemiologically important, but no clinical importance. Of course, if you have a case with symptom in a household and you study the rest of those who live there, although they are symptomatic, you may find an, an, a symptomatic infection, but doesn't have any clinical importance. And what was the second question? Would you repeat it, please? Yes. The elevation of antibodies when infected doesn't generate any defenses. What would be the difference with a vaccine? Let me see. It's an interesting question. When you acquire the infection by a serotype, you develop antibody, neutralizing antibodies against that serotype. Against that serotype, there is protection, but it doesn't protect you by the infection for other serotypes. With the uh, aggravation, with the complication that you can have a secondary response and trigger more severe forms. Antibodies do protect, but protect against the serotype that you were infected. And it predisposes you to more severe forms if you had infection by a serotype. What happens with the vaccines? And it's precisely that is why it's been so difficult to have a vaccine, an effective vaccine, despite that we have more than 40 years working in this. And it's that in order for a vaccine to be effective, it has to protect against the four serotypes. That's why the vaccines need to be tetravalent, have component of the four viruses in order to have a neutralizing response against the four. That is what makes this uh, vaccine complex to achieve. There's a lot of hope. There are some candidates like Takeda, we think that there's a more durable response to the four, but it's still quite complex. The antibodies do neutralize, do protect, but it has to be against the four viruses. There are vaccines that have candidates that have failed because they have protected in the long term against one or two serotypes only. Therefore, they're not effective. I don't know if that responds to the question of the colleague. Thank you, Dr. Castro. If you allow me to comment, first of all, the asymptomatic patients, we do not need to look for them for clinical purposes. The studies that have been done are epidemiological studies, some of them published in India, Asia, where there's surveillance of group of children and you see when they become positive. In America, Dr. Eva Harris in Nicaragua has a cohort of children who documented something of this. In Mexico, Dr. Jose Ramos has also done field studies to get this positivity. And there we have this extract that we mentioned between 60 and 80% of cases that are asymptomatic infections. But for purposes of the clinical, the clinic, this is not relevant. The other thing is that post-infection antibodies, as Dr. Osvaldo mentioned, they leave protection against that serotype was infected and three months through EIGM, they can block the infection by other serotypes. But after those three months, the patient is susceptible to infect of any other any 
other serotypes. Unfortunately, the response to the dengue virus is quite complex, not only due to antibodies, but also we have cellular factor that sometimes is difficult to evaluate. And in the evaluation of the vaccines, many times it's not to get infected again, but to prevent that the patient is admitted and die because of the disease. The vaccine performance currently is being approached as such, and this may presently give some light on the next level of protection, which is vaccination. Thank you. Very kind, doctor. For Dr. Eric Martinez, I have two questions. When the vaccine, the Pambilio vaccine was introduced in Panama, you said that a positive IgG, together with a clinical case, indicated a diagnosis of dengue when secondary infection. What is your opinion? And the second question is, what experiences are in the region in dengue vaccines? What expectations about the development of these drugs? What recommendations would you provide to decision makers to prevent what occurred with the COVID pandemic and with other diseases, the limitations of family access? Go ahead, Dr. Eric. I start with the second one. In our region, we have a very little experience with vaccines, if any. Actually, trials have been done, but in other regions of the world. Dr. Castro mentioned, today there is a renewed interest and in movement in search of a vaccine that is effective. And we explain why, the four serotypes. There have been trials done, taken a fragment of the virus from one serotype, another segment from another serotype, and it's like a Frankenstein. The result is something strange and the body accepts it in principle, but then it laughs. And, it's and at, after several months, at the beginning, there's an uh, increase in antibodies, but a few months later or a year later, they are protected, if protected, to one single serotype. So they go back to the threat of having severe dengue. Today, the new technologies provide a new hope. And it's not to take complete fragments of the virus, but very specific fragments, biochemically, biochemically speaking. And there are projects, those who work on this prefer not to disclose them and ethically, I should not mention them, but they have the possibility of overcoming that biological barrier of fourth technical stereotypes. I think it's that where we can say, with regards to the population in Latin America, don't lose hope. But the hope comes, is coming slowly. In the meantime, on one hand, provide the mosquito and to train our physicians so there's no death. Could you repeat the first question, please? Yes, of course. When the vaccine was introduced, the Pan-Bio vaccine in Panama, it was said that Pan-Bio vaccine in Panama, it was mentioned that the IgG, together with a clinical uh, presentation, indicate diagnosis of acute dengue infection with a probable secondary infection. What do you think about it? 
everything is related. Castro's response and what I just provide and the one with Jose Guadalupe are integrated. In the principle is that you vaccinate a person, but after X number of months, that person is going to have antibodies against only one serotype. And therefore, if it's infected by other serotypes, it's going to behave. So it increases the risk of having a secondary dengue. In, another, in other words, you vaccinate a person to protect, and after some time, what the, it sensitizes it for a more severe form of dengue. You are facilitating secondary dengue in that person. Therefore, this issue is still open. The dengue vaccine, we clinicians and even the epidemiologists have participated in the studies, but it's in the hands of other colleagues, virologists, immunologists, and other newer sciences, looking for the way of overcoming this barrier. And the colleagues that ask the question, I'm going to send you a tablet, a pill of patience, and wait till things improve in the scientific way, and then the technology and economic. Because remember that for dengue, not to vaccine 20 or 100 people in one country, but we have to get ready for a massive vaccination and it cannot be expensive vaccine because we're going to save from dengue, but we're going to die of hunger. Very kind. And a final question to all three. Taking advantage of your time, would it be viable and effective to develop a retrospective study of those who died in Peru to see if they had signs of alert, waiting time, resolution capacity, and preparedness of the staff. Go ahead, Dr. Jose Martinez. Well, thank you. Well, in fact, the studies must be done. But more important than this is to be prepared. It has been mentioned that Dr. Osvaldo and Dr. Eric Martinez, we are members of the International Technical Group of Arbovirosis of PAJO. And part of our effort is to share with the clinician colleagues our knowledge about the disease, and it will allow us to prepare the medical staff. I'm going to make a commercial here. In the PAHO webpage, there is a part called Virtual Classroom, where there is the Dengue course, which is a distant course in 20 hours of, of training via web, where we invite all our colleagues, physicians and nurses to visit the PAHO.org, P-A-H-O.org, look for this virtual classroom and look for the Denke course. It's free of charge for everyone. And this has enabled training of more than 50,000 personal staff in Latin America. For example, Mexico is has first place in access to this course, Ecuador second place. Dr. Gamaniel Gutierrez, he has the data, more precise data. And this is a tool that 
we can share with you so you access the information. There are two publications. Professor Eric mentioned one is the management of patients with dengue in the Americas. It's a publication from PAHO where we have participated drafts in this document. You can also download it from the PAHO webpage. It's free of charge and you can share that many times as you want. And recently there is a publication of the guidelines for the management of patients with Tenge, Zika, and Chikungunya, and it is a review with evidence-based medicine where all the actions that are being carried out in Tenge were studied. And it's not that I mentioned, it's my experience. Now we have a important bibliographical support and you can download it from the AHO webpage and can be shared. And I will briefly share with you in Mexico, as in many other countries, we are establishing clinical networks for training for the management of patients with dengue with the collaboration of the different including the two figures. We provide training to a national group and that national group trains the state groups or the provinces, depending on the organization of the country. And then in cascade down and we've been able to have an impact in a favorable way to the correct treatment of people. It's always analysis of what we see with feedback of what's going on in order to establish areas of opportunity, which is the most important. To see what are our weaknesses, and it gives us the opportunity to establish a route to correct what we could be doing wrongly. I share one of them that we have detected. At the first level, physician has to engage with a first time where many people fail. The other one is that we need to follow up of patients in order to identify the alarm signs early and the hemodynamic and we need to organize the health units. In the course, there's a part of organizing the health units where we propose ideas on how the different health systems can organize their resources in an effective way in order to approach. I apologize for the commercial. If you're going to charge me, please transfer that charge to Dr. Martinez and we can pay for the commercial. Thank you. Very kind, Dr. Jose. I'm sure that we can continue with the contribution for this important uh, link and for, the, for all the audience and the health. Dr. Osvaldo Castro, your comment, we consider it pertinent. Well, briefly, the, we always welcome research. They contribute to knowledge, allow us to characterize the outbreaks, the epidemics. They're all different. Each one has some particularities and because of population change, we have different stereotypes because the conditions are different and therefore that always adds new knowledge. And on the other hand, it allows us to identify the weakness that the system has, weaknesses that may be in the organization order, in training, in human resources, in equipment. So we welcome research. I think they're always useful. They always contribute and help. 
And therefore, if that is a question, let's do the retrospective um, investigation. I have an experience in Iquitos in an outbreak in 2011, where there was a significant number of severe cases and death. And I remember when we were presenting the cases, the physicians themselves realized of the mistakes that they committed in the case management. The exercise is always going to be very useful to improve medical care and to improve knowledge that we have. We welcome the research. May I? Yes, go ahead. I'm going to try to integrate both comments because they're very good. We need to investigate. But there's no need to start from zero. I think that this is the message of Jose de Guadalupe. He mentioned a document recently published by the Pan American Health Organization. The Pan American Health Organization has been very active in the effort of promoting the guidelines and knowledge, the instruments, and this last study of the guidelines. What do I mean by this? That in order to start research, you need to know what has already been studied and applied. Don't go out to the field with any without any knowledge because it's not going to be worth but if you take into consideration what has been studied you can continue from there let me give you an example we're all convinced in a study made in here in cuba that the white person has more disease than the black it's not racism those who have light skin compared to those who have dark skin. Well, now in the study of children with dengue done in the pediatric hospital, Dr. Araiza in Cerro, those who had more signs of alarms are the mestizo. So it's not neither bl pure black or pure white, but the mestizo. So there's a new need because what we thought that was uh, established knowledge now is in question. Just to give you an example that comes to my mind. Following to Dr. Osvaldo said, there are no places that have an expression because by different factors. But I highlight what Jose Guadalupe mentioned. You first have to know what has been demonstrated and also I will finish with this, all the possible efforts. So those documents published in the last six years are known from for most of the professionals. It's, it's very sad when you travel and you talk with colleagues and they haven't even heard about these documents from PAHO. So now this is a call to authorities or the elements from the industry that can finance the reproduction of printed material or the organization of courses, seminars, symposia. So this that we have discussed today can get to the total total or a largest amount of health professionals in our region. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Well, having finished with this excellent session, I will ask you that in one minute, give us a final message that would allow us to concentrate everything that you have expressed and the experience that you recommend in order to control the disease and death by dengue. So we start with Dr. Jorge Martinez. 
Thank you. I have the idea that the experience needs to be analyzed and look for the opportunities in order to solve these diseases that we don't treat it adequately. Eric Martinez already mentioned that the experience is written and we've shared in publications. We invite you to disseminate this document and I've offered the access to the virtual classroom of PAJO through the different offices, you can take the links and the documents, and we hope that these tools are useful for all physicians to make an early diagnosis and a timely treatment of the disease, and therefore trying to have an impact on those who die. The evidence is that we can. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Dr. Castro, go ahead. Briefly, have a good strategy for training, considering that our physicians change. There are new patients, others leave the system. Therefore, training should be systematic. And in time, the knowledge is there. We have the documents. Therefore, the countries to design inwards their own training strategy Thank you, Dr. Dr. Eric Martinez. Very simple. I'm going to talk about the treatment of dengue. The on top of it, in order to prevent death, the physician has to be on top of their patients. So this is the type of treatment they require. Balance, presence, day, night, and to manage it from the evolution point of view. Everything that we mentioned, saving lives, if it comes at the right time. Thank you on behalf of the three speakers to the Hippolyte Agreement and the World the, the anti Health Organization for this opportunity that you gave us. And if any one of you through PAHO contact us for any questions, we are here for you. Here, there, wherever you want. Dear doctors, it's been and a passionate and interesting and productive session that I am sure that's going to allow our prof young professionals have a clear idea of the phenomena produced by dengue and its consequences. And an important point is going to be that thanks to these recommendations and communications, we're going to save many lives. And I think that this is a great value of this session. A very special mention I would like to make to Dr. Jose Martinez, Dr. Osvaldo Castro and Dr. Erin Martinez for your valuable time, your recommendations, your great experience in a, approach to this problem. And you can be sure that we will, we, many of the students will look for you, and those who attend this meeting, and more than a thousand people in several parts of the continent that are receiving your knowledge and they're going to have a clear criterion on how to deal with this problem. And on the other hand, I would also like to underline special thanks to Dr. Jose San Martin and Dr. Gamaliel Gutierrez, who when we called them, they quickly responded um, with the possibility of spreading this knowledge. And also very special to our ex-president of field epidemiology in Peru, 
Dr. Jose Moya, a colleague of several field work and now is the representative of the Pan American Health Organization in Cuba. He has facilitated the possibility of having these uh, doctors who are very famous in the management of you. Thank you very much. Dr. Mariel Carmen Calle is at this moment in session with the ministers. I'm sure putting all the courage and passion that she has to face and contributing to the health problems in the region and in the world. Thank you very much and see you soon.